All right, not bad. We've got a class of 16 and, and 10 are here, so that's uh, that's not bad at all. So uh, for all of you on the call, thanks for, for coming uh, this evening for the first class uh, of the semester. Uh, of course, it's the first week of the semester, so everything is about syllabus at this point. Um, so we'll just go over a few things here uh, about the course initially. And if you've got a question, just do the hands up thing on Zoom or do something in the chat and uh, and I'll, I'll get hold of it best that we can. Uh, real quick about me. I don't know if you watched the video at, at Moodle at the opening. Uh, my name is Sean Sublett. I used to work in Lynchburg for about 11 years between 2004 and 2015. I actually did TV weather on Channel 13 there many years ago, but uh, after a while I got tired of that gig entirely. Uh, while I was in Lynchburg, the good folks there, what was then Lynchburg College, now the University of Lynchburg invited me to teach a class as an adjunct uh, for, for introductory meteorology and then an introductory climate science. And uh, they invited me back for this semester. So I'm very grateful for all the folks there uh, in environmental science, environmental studies uh, for having me back. Uh, my background, in addition to, to being a TV weather dude for 11 years uh, in Lynchburg, eight years before that, down the road in Roanoke, um, I worked briefly at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, writing code there back in the mid 90s, which was actually terribly boring, uh, which is why I left. Uh, but before that, I did my undergrad and my master's work in meteorology uh, at Penn State University. My current day job right now is working in Princeton, New Jersey, not with the university, but for a science and communications nonprofit called Climate Central, our general job or reason for existing as a nonprofit is to, to help people in the media and the public in general uh, make the connection between weather and climate, basically convey or communicate the science and the impacts of climate change to the public. So I've been doing that since about March of 2015. So it's going to be coming up on six years, starting off in this spring. Uh, I currently reside in Lower Bucks County, uh, Pennsylvania, if any of y'all are from, from Philly originally, not very far from that, so you know the area pretty well. I'm in Newtown Township, so uh, we had a little tiny bit of snow and sleet here today, uh, so that's about as exciting uh, as it gets. So I'm going to share my screen and go over the syllabus real quick, and again, I'm recording this, and, and I'll upload this to Moodle uh, when all is said and done. So we'll go over to the screen here, share it, and we'll just go over the syllabus uh, real quick. So Here's what we got. Uh, the class is going to meet this time every week, technically 7.30 to 8.30. Um, but if nobody wants to be here at that time, my feelings won't be hurt. I will certainly make it a point to be here for anybody who wants to be here. Anybody who asks questions, I, I will be here. Um, but if you want to ask questions or talk about material at another time, email me. I'll check my Lynchburg email at least once a day uh, and we can work up something. We can work a Zoom chat or, or something like that to uh, to be sure everything is taken care of. The textbook is not required. Everybody spends enough money on textbooks anyway. Um, so what I really want us to do is come away with a working knowledge of climate in general. And we can do that with the notes and the videos. I'm going to put, I've already put a few videos on Moodle to watch as the semester goes on. Please watch them. Please watch the videos. Uh, some of them are fun. I'm trying to do videos that aren't terribly dry. Uh, so I'm trying to do some reasonably good videos. There are a couple that are old and almost funny because they're kind of like period pieces. Um, so take a look at those. Uh, when you get a chance. And, and yes, that is going to be covered on the, on the exams, but not in depth. I really want you to come away with bigger concepts, a good working knowledge uh, of climate science. So what does that mean? That means a working definition of climate and weather. The first video I posted was from Catherine Hayhoe. Uh, she's a professor at Texas Tech. Uh, she's an excellent climate science communicator. In fact, she's got an entire series called Global Weirding. If you're really into this and you really want to get awfully deep into the science, you can go to your her YouTube channel, Global Weirding, Catherine Hayhoe. 
uh, and watch all those because she does a lot of like, well, what if this? And and I've heard this. What does all this mean? So she does a lot of really good uh, good debunking of some some uh, some myths out there. Um, so we need to understand, be, show, figure out how we measure and monitor the climate system. And that really comes into two big things. It's instrumental records and paleoclimate records. In other words, how in the world do we figure out what happened before we had instruments? Uh, and those are called paleoclimate records, things like ice cores, sediment cores, tree rings, things like that. So take us way back in time to get an idea what the climate was like, uh, like several years ago. A little bit of global circulations, atmospheric circulations. So we'll, we'll touch a little bit on, on weather phenomenon, uh, but the important thing to take home from this is the difference between weather and climate. Weather is what's going on right here, right now at any one spot, whereas climate is the much longer term average of, of uh, weather phenomena. For a football analogy, weather is one play in a football game uh, climate is the entire season and who won the Super Bowl. So anybody can throw an interception but still win the Super Bowl uh, at the end of the season. So that's one of the several sports analogies I like to use uh, to really illustrate the differences between climate and weather. We'll look at the causes of natural climate change as well as anthropogenic or man-made climate change because clearly climate has changed in the past, mostly in the distant past, uh, a lot of this due to orbital, orbital cycles. Uh, the Earth does not go around the, the sun in a perfect circle. The Earth's axis is not perfectly tilted at the same angle all the time. The axis actually wobbles a little bit. So all these things change the distribution of solar energy coming into the planet, uh, which gives us ice ages and interglacials, but we'll get more, more into that later on. And uh, I'll try to have a, a, a few more videos posted as we go through the semester uh, to kind of go along. Generally, I'm going to try to do a lecture, post that on Monday evenings, uh, and then have a live review on Tuesday where we can go over all the notes, uh, all the lecture and, and everything there as well. I'll also put just the raw PowerPoint files up there so you can go through them at your own pace. This is all going to be uh, on Moodle. The tested materials, again, they'll come from lecture notes and the videos. Um, I'll do three exams. They'll all be on Moodle as well. Two midterms, one final. Um, some of these will be multiple choice. And, you know, we're in a day and age where, you know, they're open book. The important thing is I want you to come home or, or get out of here with some good concepts so you know how to access the correct information and have some kind of working knowledge going forward. I don't want this to be just rote memory. Obviously, you need to know some facts. All right. But I'm hoping that you can put together some things in your head to, for some concepts uh, before we're all done with all this. Uh, it's an asynchronous class, it's an online class. So again, you don't have to be here at this time, but I will be here. The grading systems like this. Uh, oh, by the way, I'll do a few homeworks every couple of weeks or so, three or four questions, just to kind of to drive home or give you an inkling of what, what the most important concepts are. I mean, you can kind of use the homework questions as a guide to exams. So these are going to be the really most important points to take home, to take with you once this is all said and done uh, in the spring. So the homeworks will be 25%, the final will be 25%, and each of the individual uh, exams will be 25% as well. And the final, yeah, that will be cumulative. Uh, a quick outline after tonight, it kind of goes like this. It's a, a broad monitoring of the Earth's climate system, the planetary budget. In other words, uh, we know the sun heats the Earth. That's where all the real energy comes from. But what happens to that energy uh, once it gets to the Earth, how it mixes around and all that stuff, that involves the role of water in the climate system, atmospheric circulation, how the water and atmosphere interact. So that's basically the, the first third of the course. Then we go back and start looking at how we know what happened in the past. That's paleoclimates. And then look at the instrument record, essentially over the last 150 years. Uh, why, why we like some parts of the instrument record and why some parts aren't quite as good. That ties back into the natural causes of climate change, which we can use the, the paleo climate record to tell us about. And then what's going on now with anthropogenic climate change, 
uh, and how we know humans are the cause of the observed warming, especially in these last 30 to 40 years. Uh, obviously, the planet's been warming since the last ice age, what we call the last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago. But the rate of warming uh, globally in these last 100, 150 years is unprecedented in the geological record. After that, we'll do a quick, a quick overview of, of climate classifications. What does this? What, what do you mean by continental climate? What do we mean by subtropical climate? Uh, and then we'll, we'll we'll touch a little bit on on resilience and what we do with climate change and, and public policy and that kind of stuff. Not advocating for one thing or another, uh, but just kind of look at an overview of the things that are out there. Uh, before we review for the final. So with that, let's go off to, to the slide deck, the first slide deck. We'll go through these uh, about a couple dozen slides real quick. And again, I'm recording this for people coming in late, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll bring this up full screen. Um, so introduction and overview. This is actually slides originated from an older text, but a lot of the core information here hasn't changed in the last few years. I will be augmenting some of these slides with newer information uh, as we go through through the semester. So the big question here is, what is the climate system? Why do we even care about the climate system? So let's start with a working definition of what climate science is in the first place. A systematic study of the mean state, the average state of the atmosphere at a specified location. And then what's the climate of Lynchburg? What's the climate of Miami? What's the climate of Bangladesh? What's the climate of Siberia? All right, so what is the long-term expectation of the weather or the expectations of the variance of weather in those locations governed by natural laws? In other words, basic physics, the sun's coming in, you've got the orbital tilt, you've got ice, you've got land, you've got ocean currents, you've got wind patterns and that kind of thing. Um, when we define the climate, this goes back many, many, many years. Uh, study actually started with, with Greek philosophers when, when they you know, realized that, or hypothesized that the, that the earth was round and there's a very frigid zone at the poles and, and hot zones toward the equator. Um, and this just based on, on how much sunshine was coming in to a big sphere. Uh, so let's, let's go back to this climate versus weather thing uh, and it, and because I've been doing this for a long time, I kind of take for granted um, this definition, but it really is an important one. And it's important to drive home that the weather is the state of the atmosphere at some place and at some time um, described in different variables, uh, temperature, humidity, is it raining? Is it windy? Is it cloudy? You know, snow, is it hail, whatever, is it foggy? That's just the instantaneous weather at a certain place. And meteorology is a classical study of the atmosphere uh, that causes weather or the life cycle of weather systems. Meteorology, uh, the root word meteor is actually Greek for anything that falls out of the sky. So it's not, you know, the study of rocks like we think of meteors today, uh, but it's an old Greek word for stuff falling out of the sky. Uh, that's how the term meteorology came about. So climate is the long-term average of weather over a specified time interval. In classical meteorology, we like to use climate normals as a 30-year average. That was a standard set up by the Germans decades ago. 30 years is, is what's taken to be the climatological norm. But anybody can do a climatological norm over any period of time probably wouldn't say less than 30 years, that's the minimum. But you could look at the climate over 50 years, you could look at a climate average over 100 years, you can look at a climate average over 1000 years, all right? The longer term you go, the more those, those individual weather events are going to average out. So climatology or climate science uh, is the study of the climate, its controls, how it varies in space and in time. So thinking about how we're gonna define climate, there are two other ways to, to go with that. One is empirical, 
which is just you're looking at statistics. It's a basic statistical analysis. What are the, you know, how hot has it ever gotten? How cold has it ever gotten? How windy has it ever gotten? How much snow has ever fallen? Those are just statistics as opposed to dynamic, which is more in line with the forces that are driving the climate. Um, the sunrise and sunset types, the times, the elevation, the proximity to an ocean. Are you on an ice sheet? Are you on the tundra? Are you in a subtropical rainforest? Those more dynamic things, things that are controlling the climate is dynamic. How we, how we measure the climate is more statistical. So empirical versus dynamic. And, and those are two very important features because as we try to simulate future climates with our you know, big old general climate models, we have to incorporate dynamical processes into these big long series of, of computer code but then we print out information in statistics or empirical data. So we have some idea of what to actually expect. It's one thing to say, well, well, we know it's gonna be cloudier on the mean, but what does that actually mean for our temperature? How is that gonna change the expected temperature range as we go forward in time, decades at a time? So again, the climate normal encompasses, the, encompasses that variation, uh, generally over 30 years. When you hear, or I don't even know if you guys watch TV anymore, my kids sure as hell don't. Um, but when you hear, or even read online, a meteorologist talking about the climate normal, oh, this was warmer than normal. This is colder than normal. What is the normal? Generally, the normal is the 30 year average. The, the standard 30 year average right now for most places in the United States is the average of the variables whether it's high temperature, low temperature, precipitation, uh, from 1981 to 2010. Every 10 years, that is redone. Um, and who redoes that? National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that's uh, under the Department of Commerce and the federal government, will reevaluate that every 10 years. And since 2020 just ended, they're currently in the process of developing a new climate normal. So later on in May, May is the expectation now, a new series of climate normals for the United States is going to be out. So we'll shift from 1981 to 2010 to 1991 to 2020. So the smooth average of those variables will be the new climate normal. Just to go back a little bit, I talked about NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, they are the parent organization of the National Weather Service. National Weather Service uh, was derived from the U.S. Weather Bureau after the Civil War. Um, and when we talk about the National Weather Service, there are several field offices across the country, <clears throat> about 120 of them. Um, the nearest one that serves Lynchburg is actually on the campus of Virginia Tech. National Weather Service office in Blacksburg, Virginia, serves Greater Lynchburg as it does Roanoke, Blacksburg, uh, down toward Withville, northward up toward Lexington and westward into, into the, uh, the higher ski country of West Virginia. Uh, farther eastward in Virginia, that part of the state, Richmond and Norfolk, that is served by the Weather Service Office in Wakefield, Virginia, which is about 20, 25 miles east of Petersburg and, and it's a very rural location there. Uh, then up toward D.C., that area is served uh, by the National Weather Service office in Sterling, Virginia, pretty much on the grounds of Dulles Airport. And a lot of these places are co-located with airports or with universities uh, to continue to bring in new research, new understanding, and new science uh, to make operational forecasting and climate forecasting as good and as accurate as possible. Where we get most of our current weather data, like you look on your dang phone, <laughs> you look on your phone or whatever, and it says, you know, the temperature is, is 47 degrees, it's 62 degrees, whatever. Uh, those are taken from, from these things. They're called Automated Surface Observation Systems, or ASOS. Uh, and there are these large contraptions, the one on the right side of the screen there, uh, that are taking the temperature. They, they have um, sensors that determine what the humidity is. They have sensors that determine the cloud height, 
uh, what the wind speed and direction are. Uh, and they're the ones that are sending information every five minutes uh, to the weather service. And nowadays, of course, that's all uploaded to the internet. The old school is that little instrument shelter back in, in my day as an undergrad. Um, you would have a little instrument shelter. You would open the box. There'd be a little thermometer in there, a little mercury and glass thermometer that would show you what the high temperature was and the low temperature was for the last 24 hours. You would actually physically go in, read it, write it down, and, and, and put that into the, into the instrument record. The interesting, interesting thing about the instrument shelter is that it's painted white so that when the sun hits it, it reflects off. So it doesn't get unusually hot inside of that box. And it actually has some vents in there as well to let air circulate in and out. But the vents are pointed down this way. So if it rains, it doesn't fall into the box. So back in the day, you know, decades ago, those instrument shelters were, were kind of the main way to, to, get, um, to get a maximum and minimum air temperatures for the day. Uh, one of the reasons this falls under the Department of Commerce is because climate, weather, and society are important. I mean, right there is a picture of the Colorado River Basin. Um, you probably know that Arizona is known for being in a desert. Uh, a lot of southern Utah, Nevada are in a desert. Where do they get their water? Well, they get a lot of it from the Colorado River, which is dammed up into Lake Mead. Um, so water resources in the western United States are very important. Uh, because it doesn't rain there like it does here in the eastern part of the United States, uh, you need to understand that before you start using too much water, more water than you have, especially for a burgeoning population uh, in the southwestern United States. So understanding your climate, understanding your weather is very important into understanding how you're going to manage your resources, how local governments, state governments, and ultimately federal governments are going to manage natural resources. So we think of the climate system as a whole. We think about an entity, if you will, that components interact in an orderly manner according to the, to the basic laws of the universe, physics, chemistry, biology, all right? So when we look at Earth's climate system, we look at everything that's going on in the climate system. It's not just the atmosphere and the oceans uh, because there's other things going on there. You know, the atmosphere and the oceans interact, no question. But there's also the biosphere, which is anything that's living on the planet, and the geosphere. Think about geology, rocks, volcanoes, and, and that kind of stuff. So let's touch on each one of those. Um, first of all, the atmosphere. The atmosphere is very, very thin. One of the things I think gets forgotten about that if you've got an apple, and the apple represents the, the size of the earth, the thickness of the atmosphere is represented by the skin on the apple. Uh, relative to the size of the earth, the atmosphere itself is very, very thin. Most of it, most of it is in the bottom, most of it's only about 10 miles thick. Once you get past about 10 miles, there's a few molecules out there but most of the true density, most of the true mass of the atmosphere is in the bottom 10 miles. And, and where all the weather happens is in that bottom part there called the troposphere, which goes up um, to about 13, 14 kilometers. So think about six, seven miles or so. Uh, that's where most of the actions, that's where almost all the weather happens is in the troposphere. Uh, that red line on that diagram is basically how the temperature changes as you go up. And you know you probably know from elementary school. Typically, as you go up, the temperature decreases. That's why the mountains are, are colder than the beaches. All right, but once you go past a certain level, what's called the tropopause, which is the the dividing line between the troposphere and the next level up, called stratosphere, the temperature actually begins to climb a bit, and we see this kind of oscillating back and forth until you go to the to the highest part. Uh, of the atmosphere, thermosphere, and ultimately there's there's the exosphere, which is like a couple of molecules running around here or there. Uh, there's no way you'd ever breathe up there. All right, so the, the most important four levels, thermos, thermosphere, uh, excuse me, the troposphere, troposphere, sublet, troposphere is where we live. That's where we breathe. That is where all of the weather happens. The stratosphere is the next one up. That's where the temperature starts to actually increase as you continue to go up. It's where the ozone layer is. Part of the reason the temperature climbs as you go up there 
is because of the, the ozone um, produced there, all right? That actually warms things up uh, into the stratosphere. So those are the two most important ones. That's the, the bottom parts of the atmosphere are the most important. Another kind of diagram to, to give you a scale of, of where things are uh, vertically. Again, the troposphere is that bottom part. Uh, once you go into the stratosphere, that's where you'll start to see um, higher, um, not, not hot air balloons, but like, um, if you remember several years ago, there, were, there was a guy who like jumped out of a weather balloon from orbit and there was a great big media thing. Oh my gosh, he's jumping out. He's in outer space, jumping out of this balloon. No, he's in the stratosphere. The guy was in the stratosphere and that was the balloon. Um, there are some clouds in the stratosphere uh, it's called polar stratospheric clouds. They're, they're, they're not very common. Most of the clouds you will ever care about are going to be uh, in the troposphere. Then as you go farther up, Aurora Borealis, they tend to be higher up in the, in the mesosphere. And then going farther up toward the thermosphere, that's where low Earth, low Earth orbiting satellites are. Not the geosynchronous satellites where that you, know, you classically see um, in satellite imagery, cloud imagery, uh, but lower Earth satellites, lower orbiting satellites. We'll talk about the difference between uh, low Earth orbits, orbit satellites and geosynchronous uh, satellites uh, a little bit later on. But low, low orbit, like, like the International Space Station, that's in, that's in the thermosphere. Also important to know that in the atmosphere, atmosphere is mainly two gases, nitrogen and oxygen. Most of the atmosphere is those two, and there's way more nitrogen than there is oxygen in the atmosphere. Dear God, please remember that. There's still too many people wandering around thinking that the atmosphere is mostly oxygen. It's not. It's mostly nitrogen. Dear God, please, please know that. Uh, before you leave out of here. Nitrogen is far more common in the atmosphere than oxygen. Now, there are other important gases in very, very small trace amounts, all right? Like the ozone I talked about, that's mostly in the stratosphere. There's obviously water vapor, which gets converted into precipitation in the troposphere. And of course, there are other small things like carbon dioxide, uh, there's argon as well. But when we look at the total constituents total constituents in the atmosphere, nitrogen dominates. It just dominates, all right? There's enough oxygen to, to help us live, but we wouldn't even want too much oxygen. It's not good for us, all right? So you got mostly nitrogen, then oxygen, and then you have carbon dioxide, which is very, very small, but it's important. We'll talk about why later on the course, but the short version is that it's an infrared active gas. So we'll talk about the electromagnetic spectrum uh, a little bit later. Water vapor is not uniform through the atmosphere. Uh, as you know, in the winter, it is very dry. In the summer, it is very humid. So it varies and with seasons. It varies with latitude, where you are on the earth. All right. But over the entire atmosphere, if you tried to average it out, it would be about 0.4%. So that's the atmosphere. Then we've got the hydrosphere, hydro meaning water. So this is basically anything on earth is water, liquid water. Uh, so it's the water component of the climate system. Water is always being circulated, reservoirs, lakes, streams, oceans. Oceans, obviously the ultimate reservoir for all liquid water. All right, and then it just sits there and salts and stuff kind of get in there. And that's why it's so salty because there's no place else uh, for ocean water to go other than just sit in the ocean. Obviously it evaporates, we have hurricanes and storm systems like that, but all liquid water ultimately is going to end up uh, into the ocean unless it gets caught in these, these underground, uh, underground lakes. But that's, that's not something that we need to, to fret a whole lot about. Cryo meaning cold means the cryosphere. So basically anything that's frozen in the atmosphere, in the, on the earth system, the, the frozen part of the earth system is the cryosphere. All right, so this means ice sheets, ice caps, glaciers, permafrost, you know, frozen dirt, frozen soil, 
still counts as cryosphere, even though this not, you're not looking at ice. And then icebergs are even floating out to sea. Uh, and there is a difference between, uh, you know, sea ice, what's an ice cap, what is an ice sheet, what is a glacier. I mean, it's all ice, but all has a slightly different role in the overall cryosphere. And again, we'll get to that a little bit later on. Uh, the shorter version is this, a, a glacier is not static. A glacier is flowing. It flows very, very slowly, but it does flow. So it's a mass of ice that is slowly flowing down some kind of rock formation, all right? We get glaciers forming when it snows during the winter, and then in the summer, it doesn't warm up enough to melt all the snow. So you got a little snow left over. Then the next winter, it snows on top of that. And when summer comes, it's not enough to melt that off. So you've got another layer. Then the next winter, it snows on top of that, but doesn't melt during the summer. And that just goes up year after year after year after year. All right, especially in an, an environment that is getting colder, we going into an ice age. Um, so that snow ultimately gets converted to, to ice because of the pressure from the snow on top of it. Um, and that's why sometimes if you look in the glaciers, they look a little blue uh, because you removed uh, a, lot of, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of the air. So again, you've got glaciers, ice very, very slowly flowing. Um, icebergs form when chunks of this glacial ice will then break off, all right? So you've got a glacier flowing down toward the ocean, all right? But at that end, where the end of the continent meets the ocean, it's still so cold, you still have ice going out over top of the water. And that's called, um, that's called an ice sheet. So you have a glacier flowing out to where the ocean is, but there's still, there's still ice there. That's called the ice sheet before you get out to the open liquid ocean. All right, so you've got glacier flowing down to ice sheet and then open ocean, all right? Sea ice is a little bit different because that's just transient uh, ice that sits over the, over the ocean and it kind of comes and goes with the seasons. The geosphere is that solid rock part. Um, and I say solid because what we are used to seeing is solid, um, even though you go farther deeper in, into, the, uh, into the earth, you start running into the mantle, which is kind of oozy and bubbly and stuff. Um, you know, but for our purposes, aside from volcanoes, um, you know, the geosphere is basically the earth's crust. But just, you know, remember then once you go below the crust, you start to get to the mantle and then ultimately the, the core. Um, so when we think about the lithosphere, we're talking about the crust and, and then with the solid part of the upper mantle, we're not too worried about uh, the inner and the outer core. Um, so the lithosphere, which is part of the geosphere, meaning just ground, um, that's modified through weathering processes and erosion. And they're slightly different. Weathering is, is physical disintegration uh, or decomposition uh, of rock. But erosion is the removal of, of stuff. You know, we hear about beach erosion. Well, that means you're removing sand away from the beach. Whereas weathering is when you are smashing water up against a rock and breaking it up into sand. All right, so, so weathering and erosion are, are similar, but ultimately have different goals. Weathering breaks stuff down, disintegrates it. Erosion takes it away, all right? And then of course, on the much longer term, these geological timeframes, um, we talk about volcanoes and then plate tectonics, meaning, you know, you know things that cause earthquakes, uh, smashing to each other, ultimately lead to, to mountain building in the very, very long time scale. Uh, biosphere is you and me and plants and animals and protozoa and all that stuff. Um, so that interacts with the environment around it. So you've got things like photosynthesis, all right, so you're taking in um, carbon dioxide and water, releasing sugars and oxygen. That's how most you know, classical green plants uh, are creating food and, and energy. And there's cellular respiration, like you and me, 
uh, we're processing foodstuffs and water uh, and turn that into energy to grow. And then we release carbon dioxide uh, and heat back to the environment. And by the way, while, while you and me and animals do release carbon dioxide, it's a teeny, 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 tiny amount compared to uh, the carbon dioxide that is released when we burn stuff to, uh, to make electricity, but more on that in a bit. This also encompasses things like you know, producers, consumers, decomposers. If you think about, you know, worms you know, breaking down trash to, into soil, that kind of stuff. Um, the whole classical food web, when we start getting deeper into biology there. Um, but you have to start thinking about ecological systems now. How is one population of organisms dependent on another population of organis organisms? Um, that does play a role in the things like red tides, which we'll get to later. That does play a role into how much oxygen is in the atmosphere. So those things do play a role. Living things are not independent from the environment around them. So then you can get really deep into this and you start to see uh, biogeochemical cycles. And this is really getting out there. But, you know, solids, liquids, and gases moving among different reservoirs on the earth going through physical or chemical changes uh, in the process. So although Earth is an open system for energy, you know, the energy is received mainly by the sun and to a lesser extent from the own interior. You know, if you hurt volcanoes, um, hot springs, that's also a geothermal energy. Um, they're also sending energy back to space. So you've got incoming solar and you've got outgoing terrestrial energy. That outgoing terrestrial energy can come from the ground or come from beneath the ground or work its way up. All right, so when we think about what balances the temperature at any one place at any one time, um, you've got energy in and energy out. Energy in is largely from the sun. Energy out is out sending back out um, from the earth. So to get a little bit physical here, um, these kind of cycles do obey the conservation of matter and energy. You know, matter cannot be created or destroyed, that kind of classic stuff. But energy can change its state, go from one physical or chemical form to another. Um, and this goes back to what we'll talk about later on in the carbon cycle. In other words, the amount of a substance stored in a reservoir uh, depends on how fast it cycles through the system. Like the classical water cycle that you might have heard, remembered from elementary school, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, that's pretty quick. But then there's something called the carbon cycle, which is way, way, way slower. Um, and that's part of the problem with the current climate system or climate changes. We're putting in carbon dioxide uh, into the atmosphere far faster than it will ever come out naturally through its natural cycle. So, and that time uh, is called the residence time or the average amount of time it takes for a substance to be replaced or kind of turn over. So the residence time for water is a lot shorter than the residence time of carbon. So to sum this up, this is kind of a big overcompassing climate paradigm, if you will. Um, so you can explain the climate primarily uh, in terms of the redistribution of heat energy and matter through this couple atmospheric ocean system. You got energy in, you got energy out, you've got energy interacting with all this stuff on the earth, whether it's people and animals and plants and oceans and glaciers um, and atmosphere. All this stuff working together to create kind of the climate that we're in at the moment. But uh, it does vary. And we'll talk about natural climate variation a little bit later. And everything that we've seen uh, from paleoclimate records and instrumental records tells us that right now, these last 30 or 40 years in particular, the human activities are playing a very, very important role in the climate system, right? So at, at some point, and again, this is later in the course, we'll talk about what, what we should do about it, all right? What any one of us could do, what all of us as a society could do, long-term stewardship, all, all that stuff. But that's farther down the road for the most part right now, we need to get into the, the core physical understanding of the climate system first before we can understand how it is changing both in the past and the present. All right, so with that, we'll, we'll wrap for the evening. 
and I'll get this posted online either later tonight or tomorrow. Uh, for the first homework set on Moodle, some I see three or four, you've already turned this in, that's great. Um, this is basically, I just want to know what you want to understand the most from this course. So then, you know, five years from now, somebody to ask it, did you take a climatology course? You can say, yeah, well, what do you remember? So, well, this is what I remember. I remember X, Y, and Z. What do you really want to know coming out of here by April and May? What do you really want to take away from this? You know, what's your whole reason for being here? And look, if, if it's honest, like, well, I just need to take this to get my degree. That's fine. Just tell me. No harm, no foul. Um, so there's no right or wrong answer. Just want to just need to know where everybody stands, where everybody's coming from. So just download the thing on Moodle, 30 to 300 words. You don't have to get really long winded about it. Uh, just tell me what, why you're here, what, what this is all about for you. And frankly, why you care and all of that's good um, because that's just the way of the world. So that is it uh, for tonight. I want to thank still 11 of you here. So thanks for, for sticking around uh, for these 45 minutes. Um, nobody chatted, which not a shock that happens, but uh, drop me an email later on if you want. I can answer some more questions. Um, again, this is the first time I look, it's the first time I've taught something uh, entirely online, virtually. So if you're like, man, what is Sublet doing? It's fine. We'll work through it. It'll all be okay. Uh, but in terms of that first homework set, just give me that information by the end of, by the end of Sunday night so I can take a look at it on Monday. Uh, before I get the next thing uploaded Monday night uh, and we could talk on Tuesday. So with that, I thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, enjoy the rest of your night. If you have any questions, send me an email. Otherwise, take care. And I hope to talk to some of you again very soon. Good night.